shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 9. Every lie, Proverbs 19:5. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19:5. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have Sabbath, the 15th of September 2018. And I'm gathered here together via the internet connection via Skype with my wonderful brother in Christ over there in the United States of America, Brett Norman, to come to you, I think, with, if I'm not mistaken, the 11th reading of, uh, yeah, you know, the whole history we have been talking about. Peter was not in Rome. Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. Simon Peter meets the competition. Whatever name you want to give it, we are analyzing and reading the book from Ernest L. Martin at this moment. Uh, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus or Simon Peter meets the competition after the introductory five readings we did before. And today I'm only connected with brother Brett because our brother Michael in Germany had other very important things to attend to and he couldn't join us today but he probably will be back tomorrow with our next reading i hope that if everything runs smoothly we will come back together on the 16th of september sunday to do another reading but for today i'm very glad that i can uh, announce to you that i will uh, that i have invited already my brother brett in the united states of america and i want to invite brett to this broadcast hello brett welcome Hi, Yerk. Thanks for inviting me, and great to be here, and uh, really interested to learn more about the false assumption, one of the many false assumptions of this world, but one that's very, very, very significant to far more Christians than they know, than the people know. So let's go for it. Yeah, uh, just one little announcement in uh, uh, in, uh, in my own business, <laughs> in the business of Juggler 66, the video channel. Um, for the moment, I have some 9,980 or something subscribers. And I uploaded this week two English spoken videos. The one that I mirrored from Brett that he uh, recorded the 4th of September and published the 11th of September a very intimate, private and um, interesting video to watch. And after that I published uh, a Bible study I did with Tom Fress a while ago on the importance of understanding Second Thessalonians chapter 2. That's a two-parter in the first hour I uploaded. Now why am I mentioning this? Because I got freaking 150 views per video after now four or five days they have been uploaded. This is just ridiculous for somebody who quote-unquote has about 10,000 subscribers on this channel and they are not all German, I can tell you that. I'm just asking myself where have all my English subscribers gone? Are they not interested in this wonderful news to show them how the Roman Catholic Church misuses, abuses the Bible, the Word of God, and declares himself to be, or declares itself to be, the apostolic successor of the Apostle Peter? Is really nobody interested out there? I don't get it. Just write me in my comments, because I don't understand it. Second Thessalonians 2, that is such an important video I made with Tom Fress, two yes, hour yes. long, and it doesn't, doesn't even have 150 views within three days? Hello? Just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I really had to start with that because I had to get that off my chest. So, 
We are on page 15 of the book from Ernest L. Martin, Simon the Sorcerer. And we are going to read that Peter was not in Rome. And as you can see, uh, see it says proof 5. By the way, I have to enlarge this a little bit so it's easier for you and me to read along. Uh, it says here, Peter was not in Rome. That is the next point that we are addressing because we are about to face 10 major New Testament proofs of which we have been seen already five in the last episode of this reading. And all these 10 major Testament proofs completely disprove the claim that the Apostle Peter was in Rome from the time of Claudius until Nero. It even completely disproves that Peter ever was in Rome, even before that time or after that time. Yeah? Not only between the time Claudius and Nero, but ever. He never, N-E-V-E-R, was in R-O-M-E, Rome, Italy. <laughs> This, these biblical points speak for themselves and any one of them is sufficient to prove the ridiculousness of the Catholic claim. Any one, that means any of the ten points standing by itself, is sufficient. Notice what God tells us. The truth is conclusive as the lie is inconclusive. Proof 5. At the end of Paul's epistle to the Romans, he greets no fewer than 28 different individuals, but never mentions Peter even once. Therefore, you can look up Romans chapter 16, the whole chapter, and we read that in the last broadcast. Remember, Paul greeted all these people that we have read last time in Romans chapter 16 in 55 or 56 AD. Why didn't he mention Peter? Because Peter simply wasn't there. Proof 6. Some four years after Paul wrote Romans, he was conveyed as a prisoner to Rome in order to stand trial before Caesar. When the Christian community in Rome heard of Paul's arrival, they all went to meet him. Quote, when the brethren, speaking of the brethren of Rome, heard of us, they came to meet us, unquote, as we can verify. Because you always have to verify things said here, that that is true, by the King James 1611 authorized version of the Bible, in the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 15. Again, also here, when the brethren of Rome heard us, they came to meet us, there is not a single mention of Peter among them. This would have been extraordinary had Peter been in Rome, for Luke always mentions by name important apostles in his narration of the book of Acts. But he says nothing of Peter meeting with Paul. Why? Because Peter was not in Rome. Again, we are making the same point over and over and over until you maybe finally get it. I mean, like the point that the papacy is the Antichrist over and over and over until you maybe finally will get it and come back from your indoctrinated lie in the system of a future Antichrist and a seven-year tribulation and a rapture. That will never happen. Proof 7. When Paul finally arrived at Rome, the first thing he did was to summon the chief of the Jews together, as we can read in Acts chapter 28, verse 17. To whom, speaking of the chief of the Jews, he, quote, expounded and testified the kingdom of God, unquote, as we can rely on, in, as it is uh, written in Acts chapter 28, verse 23. We can verify. That was the word I was looking for. So you have to take a sip of my coffee. Maybe Brett wants to say something in the meantime. <laughs> yes, verification is always a good thing, especially when it comes to the Word of God. That's we true. Can, uh, we can uh, use uh, this uh, wonderful verse that we studied in, uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 again, if I can look that up quick. Okay, yeah. let me let yeah. me open the Bible right there. Hebrews chapter 4. Yeah, was it verse... T I want to say 12, but I might be wrong. Um, let's see. 
I'm just looking up in my paper Bible. <laughs> okay. And yeah. I'm opening the Bible here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, For the word 10. of God is quick and powerful no. and sharper than any two-edged sword. Yes. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what you wanted to share with us, Brett? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a very interesting verse. Yeah, we just went through uh, the Bible study with Tom Fress uh, a fortnight ago through Hebrews chapter 4. Last week we did Hebrews chapter 5, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we did. And yep. in a few hours we are going to take on probably Hebrews chapter 6. And uh, this is a very important book, the book of Hebrews. Um, also for many Christians to study because there is quite a detention between the teaching of the SDA and the teaching of the Bible because the SDA church refers to Hebrews I don't know which chapter right now I don't care for the teaching of the SDA that's why mm -hmm. um, that they point this out to um, quote unquote solidify their teaching of the 2300 days quote unquote years day year prophecy of Daniel of the prophet Daniel in chapter 8 if I'm not mistaken so the book of Hebrews is a very very important book to understand anyway for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. What does this sentence, Brett, do to the people who speak of an eternal soul? Mm. Yeah, that's right. What does that do? That's a very good question. Because they say the spirit and the soul is the same thing, right? Yes. What do it's they say not. when people die? Oh, the spirit leaves the body, or the soul leaves the body. They always put soul and spirit together. But when the word of God is so quick and powerful, even to dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, they must be two separate things. That's right, Dirk. They sure are. So, we have, we have another lie discovered by the Roman Catholic Church, which teaches the... Uh, uh, what what do they call it? Um, oh. oh, about the soul, um, eternal soul. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, oh boy. Yeah, the story yeah, of the eternal like soul. That. You know? I forget what that is. The immortality of the soul is that exactly. It? Thank you. Yeah, that was the word I couldn't come on. Yeah, mm -hmm. the immortality of the soul. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's a doozy. I, I I never even really heard about that till I started reading Charles Chinnaquee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he makes a point on that, right? Yeah, he did, and and you you actually told me about that straight away, and I was like, wow, the immortality of the soul. That is a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. That comes right out of Babylon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. Uh, proof 7, we've just read. Um, when Paul finally arrived at Rome, the first thing he did was to summon the chief of the Jews together to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. But what is amazing is that these chief Jewish leaders or elders claimed they knew very little even about the basic teaching of Christ. All they knew was that, quote, as concerning this sect, speaking of Christianity, we know that everywhere it is spoken against, unquote, as we can read in Acts 28, verse 22. Then Paul began to explain to them the basic teaching of Christ on the kingdom of God. Some believed, the majority didn't. Now, <laughs> has anything changed? <laughs> Between the time of the writing of this book from Ernest L. Martin, that has anything changed between the time of the Apostle Paul explaining the basic teaching of the kingdom of Christ to some people and today in 2018? 
I don't think there have been many changes, because some believe the majority didn't. That's exactly the way it is today, right, Brett? It sure is. Yep, and we can see that on the numbers in our YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> some believed, but the majority? Forget about it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, what does this all mean, the author asks. It means that if Peter, just suppose, if, that if Peter, who was himself a strongly partisan Jew, had been preaching constantly in Rome for 14 long years before this time, and was still there, how could these Jewish elders or leaders have known so little about even the basic truths of Christianity? Ask yourself this when you go into your humble secret prayer to the Lord in the night, when you, when you ask for um, edification in the Word of God, when you ask for understanding, how could the Roman Catholic Church betray you all your life? How is it possible that when Paul began to explain to the elders in Rome the teaching of Christ, that some believe the majority didn't, how was it then when Peter supposedly was still there for at least 14 years, how could they have known so little even about the basic truths of Christianity? This again is clear proof. Peter had not been in Rome prior to 59 AD. And he had not been there after that neither. There's no mention of Peter in Paul's letters. By the way, I'm giving you a picture here of Simon Magus, the real Peter that founded the Roman Catholic Church with his sorcery. Proof 8. After the rejection of the Jewish elders or leaders, Paul remained in his own hired house for two full years. During that time he wrote epistles to the Ephesians, he wrote epistles to the Philippians, the Colossians, he wrote an epistle to Philemon and to the Hebrews. And while Paul mentions others as being in Rome during that period, he nowhere mentions the Apostle Peter. The obvious reason is, again, the Apostle to the circumcision just wasn't there. Proof 9 with the expiration of Paul's two years' imprisonment, he was released. But about four years later, which must be around the near, uh, and, 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 and around near the year 65 AD, he was again sent back a prisoner to Rome. This time he had to appear before the throne of Caesar and he was sentenced to die. Paul describes these circumstances at length in 2 Timothy. In regard to his trial, notice what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Quote, At my first answer, no man stood with me. But all men, speaking of those in Rome, forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Isn't that like when Jesus Christ was on trial? Everyone forsook him. Even the Apostle Peter denied him three times before the cock, cock crew two, twice, or thrice. I don't know, I think twice even. Twice, yeah. Think um, right. You know, nobody was with Christ, nobody was with Paul. And you know what, Brett? Nobody will be with you, and nobody That's will right. be with me, and nobody right. will be with you, dear listener, if you are teaching this unbridled truth to the world. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Men will forsake you, who will not forsake you, who will always be with you, who will always give you the strength to work through the situation, is your Lord Jesus Christ. So Amen. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Paul ends. Please, Brett, you have a comment there? Oh, yeah, it's just the incredible truth of the comforter of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, when Jesus uh, 
had to leave his apostles, his disciples. And they uh, were very sad. And they didn't really understand. And how could they? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sure if I was in those shoes, too, I wouldn't understand, Yerk. Because God is so much more magnificent than us. You he know? absolutely is. Yeah, it takes us a long time to catch up to his workings. <laughs> Just to even kind of wrap our brains around it. How can the ant understand the thinking of the man? <laughs> Good point. Doesn't work so easy. Just to give you a little comparison. Huh? Yeah, when the man kills the ant, yeah. <laughs> It doesn't even have to kill it because I'm not speaking about no. God killing us, but you know. No, no, no. I'm just being. But the point is, how can an ant understand the thinking of man? It can't. How can the pot understand the thinking of the man that made him? I mean, that is maybe even a better parable to say. Anyway, we are in proof nine. He says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men in Rome forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. This means, if we believe the Catholics, if we are so stupid to believe a man rather than our God who is in heaven, our Father who is in heaven, when the Bible says in Psalms 118, verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man, if we believe the Catholics that Peter forsook Paul, for they tell us Peter was very much present at Rome during this time. Peter, the apostle to the circumcised, once denied Christ, but that was before he was converted. And to believe that Peter was in Rome during Paul's trial is untenable. It is just ridiculous. Proof number 10. The Apostle Paul distinctly informs us that Peter was not in Rome in 65 AD. Ah, uh, what did he say? Even though Catholics say that he was, Paul said, only Luke is with me. Is there anybody in this world who can read the sentence and interpret into it only Luke in the form of Peter was with me? Or only Luke was with me because uh, Peter asked him to come and he stood by me and Peter did not? Or how can you twist this sentence and make of it that Peter was in Rome? which he had to be because the Roman Catholic Church claims that he was the first bishop of Rome. Paul distinctly informs us that Peter was not in Rome because he said, only Luke is with me. You know, this is not hearsay. This is the Bible. This is the word of God. God provides us with his truth. God is incapable of lying, very much in difference of how the Roman Catholic Church is only capable of lying. God has not even the possibility of lying. He is not able to. He could not lie even if he wanted to. <laughs> he does not want to, but he is not capable of it. It's an impossibility for him as it is an impossibility for you to fly. Well, maybe it's not an impossibility when your faith is strong enough because the real faith can put mountains aside, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> but right. Think, think of any kind of parable that you want, how something is absolutely impossible. God is not able of lying. He is not in the, in, in the possibility of lying. So, only Luke was with me. So, we have a... Proof in the written word of a God that cannot lie that only Luke was with Paul at this moment and not Peter. 
if you do not believe this sentence, only look as with me as it is uh, written down in Second Timothy chapter four, verse eleven. If you do not believe this, then you do not believe the word of God. Then again, turn to Psalms one hundred eighteen, verse eight. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Then you put your confidence rather in Catholics than you put in the Lord. Your choice. That's a choice that you have to make. Right. You don't have free will, but you have a choice that you can make. And your choice can be, and in this regard should be, to listen to God and not to what man teaches. The truth, the author says, becomes very plain. Paul wrote to Rome. He had been in Rome and at the end wrote at least six epistles from Rome. And not only does he never mention Peter, but at the last moment he even says, only Luke is with me. So, Paul wrote to Rome, had been in Rome, and wrote from Rome, and never ever mentions Peter. What does that say to you? Peter, therefore, never was Bishop of Rome. We come to the next part of the book. Just changing the picture here. Do I have something else I can put up here? Well, yeah, you know, this flying Simon Magus. Remember, this is according to a legend. Yeah, This is not Peter on the ground praying for Simon Peter to fall down, because Peter the Apostle never was in Rome. But still, I like that picture of that flying Simon here. Now, where was Peter? Near 45 AD, we find Peter being cast into prison at Jerusalem, as we can read in, Act, as we can read in Acts chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. In 49 AD, so some four years later, he was still in Jerusalem, this time attending the Jerusalem Council. About 51 AD, he was in Antioch of Syria, where he got into differences with Paul, because he wouldn't seat or, uh, sit or eat with the Gentiles. Strange that the quote-unquote Roman bishop would have nothing to do with Gentiles in 51 AD, but being the first bishop of the Gentile church in Rome? Hmm. Later, in about 66 AD, we find him in the city of Babylon among the Jews, as it is recorded in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Remember that Peter was the apostle to the circumcised. Why was he in Babylon? Well, I think we made that point very clearly when we put a little part of the video of... Um, even at the doors, if I remember correctly, in the last part uh, of this series, Brett? Is it correct? Mm -hmm. That was there, right? Why was yep, he in Babylon? Right. Yeah? yeah, we sure did. Yeah, Because history shows that there were as many Jews in the Mesopotamian areas in Christ's time as there were in Palestine. So it's no wonder we find him in the East and the real Babylon, and not the Babylon that is also called Rome, because perhaps this is the reason why scholars say Peter's writings are strongly Aramaic in flavor, the type of Aramaic spoken in Babylon. Why, of course, Peter was used to their Eastern dialect. At the times the Catholics believed Peter was in Rome, the Bible clearly shows he was elsewhere. The evidence is abundant and conclusive. By paying attention to God's own words, no one need be deceived. Peter was never the bishop of Rome. Yeah. I like this Peter this picture oh, yes. better where we have the disputation of Peter on the left and Simon Peter on the right dressed in black as a short rope Jesuit. <coughs> Peter was used to their Eastern dialect. Peter was never the Bishop of Rome. A. Peter was in Rome 2000 years BC. <laughs> Who was this first Peter of Rome? <gasps> what were his successors called? 
the history of ancient religion reveals the plain truth about the original Peter of Rome. The truth about his real successors is now clear to us, but hidden to the world. Why is the truth hidden from the world and clear to us? Because we study the word of God. We study the 1611 King James Bible in English and we understand that we have to trust our Lord and not to put any faith in anything a man says. And it is the Roman Catholics who say that Peter was in Rome and God says otherwise. So who are you going to believe? Well, the truth about his real successors is very clear to us because we read and understand and believe and live for the living word of God, the Bible, and the majority does not, which is why those truths are hidden to the world. Here is what history shows us of the original Peter of Rome. The truth, my dear brethren, is startling. The Bible records that in the earliest ages, right after the flood of Noah, men began to rebel against the teachings of God. They begin to build cities, they found religions, they bring in idolatries. Pagan temples were erected, the Tower of Babel came on the scene. All of these things started within the first 200 years after the flood. Now pagan gods called Peters, is there any way that we can historically and biblically prove that pagan gods are called Peters or Peters? Well, surprising as it may sound, it is a well-known fact among students of ancient religion that the chief pagan gods worshipped in the early civilizations were generally known by the name Peter. It is also known that the priests of those heathen gods were also called Peters. That same name, in one form or another, was even applied to the pagan temples consecrated to those gods. Notice was Bryant, a very important historian who also is mentioned in Alexander Hislop's work The Two Babylons. In his work, Ancient Mythology says, quote, Not only the gods, but the Hierophantae, which are special priests, in most temples, and those priests in particular who were occupied in the celebration of mysteries, were styled patrus. Unquote. Now this is significant, and why? Because the same the word pater, p a t r e, is the same pator, p a t o r, or peter, p e t e r, in meaning and even in pronunciation. So, Peter, you actually pronounce Peter. And where do you want to have proof from this? Well, you know that the ancient Babylonian goddess Ishtar actually is pronounced in English Easter. So, there you have it. Many words that are written in a different name are pronounced this way. And this brings me even back when we have the word Peter here it's the same pronounced as Peter. This brings me back to the book reading that I did with Rulers of Evil. Because Tapa Saucy made that point in chapter 24, the mark of Cain, that the Peter, as you can read it here, is pronounced Peter, stands for the word the firstborn. And who was the firstborn in this world with the knowledge of good and evil? Cain. So actually, this Peter all goes back to the very first man born into this world with the knowledge of good and evil after the fall of man, the firstborn of Adam and Eve, Cain. And maybe now it sounds a little bit different when you read later on in the same chapter or in the beginning of chapter 24 of Rulers of Evil of the prayer that uh, Pope, was it Paul the Sixth or John the Twenty-Third? 
Mm. I don't remember. One of the two popes. I think it was John the Twenty Third with the opening of the Second Vatican Council in 1965. Prayed that we bear the mark of Cain. Just turn to the book Rulers of Evil and you can study that for yourselves. But here you see how it is important not only to read one book, but to read numerous books, <laughs> like, I'd like yeah. to say, <laughs> <laughs> and then are being able to connect the dots and see that something uh, is written in this book, another author on a completely different kind of subject mentions in the very same way. This Peter is pronounced Peter, and according to Tapasosi, that stands for the firstborn. And that is Cain. And then the Pope says in 1965, we bear the mark of Cain. How much more proof do you need? What Peter are they based on? Huh? Let's just repeat the sentence. This is significant. The word Peter is the same as Peter or Peter in meaning and pronunciation. So the word Peter is the same as Peter or Peter because it is pronounced the same way. Now Bryant even continues and says Peter was undoubtedly a religious term, the same as Peter and Petora. Oh, that's like uh, Peter and Pebble, wow. right? The stone and the rock, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The ancient pagan gods, the priests who were their ministers, and their sacred sanctuaries. Yeah. So as well as the gods, as the priests, as the sanctuaries, as the temples, were all called. Peters or Peters. Either spelling is acceptable since vowels are fluid in all languages, especially the Semitic. And therefore we have to understand one thing to make this very, very sure. In Hebrew, at least in the ancient Hebrew, I don't know about Hebrew of today because I don't speak Hebrew, there weren't any vocals. You would write these words P T R S or P T R S. Uh, oh, oh! Did, did I just say the same thing twice? P T R S. You would only use the consonants. You would not use the vowels. There were no vowels. So this is why the spelling is acceptable in both ways, because vowels are fluid in all languages, especially the Semitic, especially Aramaic, especially Hebrew, because they didn't even use in the ancient times any vowels. Interesting point, uh, Brett. Oh, yes, absolutely. You have some comment to make here, or shall I continue in the reading? Please continue, yes. The meaning of the word Peter. What did the word, and I pronounce it now, obviously, the way that it is written, not to give you any uh, not to, how, 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 how am I saying that? Make not, it confusing. Yeah, maybe. yeah, thank you. Yeah, confusing. I just couldn't get to that word. Not to confuse that's all right. you. <laughs> not to come. Yeah, that's why I need you on the show, Brad, because uh, I cannot no find doubt. my own it's words. It's always good to, <laughs> to read books together. I've noticed that too, and in, uh, in absolutely right, brother. It's, it's just so much easier, you know, because then if there is a major problem, you can step in and say, hey, oh, 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 are you sure about that, Yerk? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. not to confuse you, I will pronounce it the way that it is written and not the way that it should be pronounced because vowels are fluid in all languages as we just read. The meaning of Peter. What did the word Peter or Peter really mean to the ancients? Surprisingly enough, the word is in the Bible. When Moses wrote about the Egyptian priests, he shows they were called Peters or interpreters. Uh, interpreters of the ancient Egyptian mysteries. Notice Genesis chapter 41 verse 8. Davidson shows in his Hebrew lexicon that the consonantal word PTR, which of course without any vowels stands for Peter, signifies to interpret or interpretation. Brian points out that the term always related to oracle interpretation. The pagan priests of the mystery religions were called Peters or Peters. They had the power to interpret the heathen mysteries. 
This is further brought out by Bunsen in his hieroglyph, where he shows that the Egyptians, as the Bible also indicates, called their interpreters or priests Peter. The term Peter was one of the earliest names for the pagan gods. It lasted as late as Greek and Roman times. But by that time the term also took on a widespread secular meaning. It came generally to, me to mean father or parent. But this was not its primary meaning at all. Bryant continues in his work, the Quote, the word pater, when used in the religious addresses of the Greeks and Romans, meant not, as it's supposed, a father or parent, but related to the divine influence of the deity, called by the people of the East, pator, unquote. As you can read in Bunsen's work, The Hieroglyph. In many, <coughs> sorry, in many ancient religions, the father was the chief priest of the family. That is the reason the head of the family became named as Pator or Father. The father, because of his priestly position, became known as the Archpator or Archpator, or as it is commonly rendered, Patriarch. Uh, this is how the term Pator came to signify, in a secular sense, a father, but originally it always meant interpreter, especially one of the mystery religions. Chief pagan gods called Peters. Now let's do a little study of the chief pagan gods before we come to the conclusion of this video. And oh, still 20 minutes, so we still have some time to go. We have clear evidence, the author says showing that the ancient Romans called their chief gods Peters, the divine interpreters. The early Roman writer Lucilius mentions Neptune, Liber, Saturn, Mars, Janus and Quirinus. All were Peters. And by the way, uh, Saturn, Mars, Janus and Quirinus are names of the hills of the city on the seven hills Rome. Just a little extra information. All were painters. So therefore you have to look into Lucili Fragment's work. He did not mean they were father gods. He meant they were gods of Peter rank, meaning the chief gods. Lucilius doesn't exhaust the list. In fact, he leaves out Jupiter, the quote-unquote father of the Roman gods. And this Jupiter, by the way, <laughs> yeah. I mean, while we're at it, we can He's maybe due. even add a little picture here, right, Brett? That's right. You know what's coming up anyway. Eh? I sure do. Let's see. He is looking, he is looking. Uh, for example, let's take this one. This is quite interesting. This yeah. is Jupiter. As you can find him in the Roman Catholic Church in the in this dome of St. Uh, Saint Peter, in the Basilica of St. Peter, dressed as a Pope. And here you can see his feet, where when you take a very close look, I don't know if on this picture it is very good, uh, it is not so, Good enough, yeah. so so well to see, but he doesn't have any toes anymore. Why? <laughs> because millions of Catholics through the time passed there and put their lips on the feet of this supposedly Peter, who in fact actually is Jupiter, to kiss them because they have the superstitious belief that that is for good luck. Hmm? Okay, so, Lucilius doesn't exhaust the list. In fact, he leaves out Jupiter, the guy who we see right here, the quote-unquote father of the Roman gods, but it was unnecessary to mention him as a Peter god due to his rank, 
the title Peter was actually incorporated as a part of his name. He was called Jew Peter. And Jew Peter I pronounce not in the way that it is G J E W. No, it's J U. Yeah? Understand that correctly, right? That's yeah? right. Like uh, the, like the planet that they tell us is yeah. Jupiter. Yeah. Act, uh, uh, absolutely. But I just have to make this point, Brett, because otherwise people are saying, "Oh, this is from the Jews." <laughs> yeah, that's right. He was called Jew Peter. J U Peter, not J E U Peter. Okay. Just get your facts right. Gladstone, in his work on the antiquities of Greece, shows that this Jupiter and the Greek god Zeus were one of the same. Hmm. J.U. Peter was the Roman way of saying Zeus Peter, the chief god of the Greeks, as we can read in the works of Homer and the Homeric Age. Peter was the name that came to signify high rank among the gods and among their priests. Now, the Greeks used the term Peter, in which way we are going to read right away. The Romans were not the only ones who called their god Peters. The classical manual reveals that the Greeks used the term Peter or its variants as often as did the Romans. For example, Apollo was called Petraeus and his followers Apollo Petraeus. Bosanius tells us that Artemis and Bacchus were called Petora, that is Peter gods. Pindar speaks of Poseidon Petraeus. He says that the Thessalians, or Thessalonians probably, Worship Neptune under this title, you know. The Thessalians must be the same as the Thessalonians of old in the book of the Thessalonians, because there were a lot of heathen right there, right, Brett? Yeah, that's right. So if you don't understand the Thessalians, that's probably the Thessalonians, because we speak about Greece, and that was in Greek. The Thessalonians are situated in Greece. In Egypt... The Ammonian priests, who headed one of the chief pagan oracles of ancient Egypt, were called Peters, as Bryant also says in his work, quote, The chief instrument, or the chief idol in their hands, was styled Pietorum. Unquote. This idol on many occasions took the form of a pole or upright stake. Huh. Obelisk, anyone? The pagan god Artemis is often pictured standing by a stone pillar which is called Petroa or Peter, as we can read in Pausanias, his book number one. These pillars and all the phallic symbols like them came to be known as Petras, the sacred Peters. It is still common among the vulgar to refer to the male member of its original religious name, Peter. These phallic Peter stones can be found all over the ancient world. And you got a very big one in Washington and you got even the biggest one in Texas. Mm -hmm. The fact there is not a mention of an ancient pagan oracle temple without some notice being given to a Peter emblem, the sacred stone. Maybe now you understand why they put these obelisks all over the world. Rome, Paris, Washington, Central Park, New York, the biggest phallus in, uh, in Texas. Yeah. Ah, you know what, Jörg? There's even one in walking distance from my house here. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Taking, take, uh, right. what, what, is that, what is that obelisk called in Texas? Uh, this biggest one in the world. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I just forgot it. It's, it's here, Texan Obelisk. Uh, ah. I, I, I don't have the name right now, but, you know, and on the top, he has the six-pointed star. Or the five-pointed five star. five-pointed star, yeah, five-pointed star. Yeah, the pentagram, star. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
Uh, when you Google it, you will find the name easily. I, it, it just uh, slips me right now. Oh, that's interesting. That I'm sure there's tons of research we could do on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, while I'm reading, you can you can look that up and Google when you uh, when you, you know, Google the world's biggest obelisk in Texas. At the base of that obelisk, right there, you're showing. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like a, a temple. Yeah, you sure. Enter in. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And there's no windows. <laughs> no, it's got to be dark in there, right? Yeah, kind of like the crypt, uh, the uh, skull and bones crypt, or whatever. Oh. This is, by the way, one in, uh, in Italy that you still find today, uh, with the name of Mussolini. The, wow! The no, I've never there. seen that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, I think I used this one in the reading of uh, Secret History of the Jesuits or Behind the Dictators in one of those videos. Interesting. One of those yes. videos. Yeah. It's uh, got to be in the Secret History of the Jesuits. I have yet to upload one yeah. here soon. <laughs> uh, they yeah, even, got many they even do. Look, look here. Do you see that in the back there? Wow. There, there's a figure, right? That's a person. That's that's a figure. Almost there. looks like a golden figure. Ah, okay, but that's because of the color, because of the sunshine. Like this one looks also golden. Ah, yes. But this right. is a kind of a figure. But you know, the interesting point is, Brett, they wanted to put a 60-foot uh, statue of Mussolini on top of this. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, there are a lot of things you don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. me, like me too. But uh, this is what I read in uh, Secret History of the Jesuits. So you will come to that. Point. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. So if you want to, Brett, you can look that up about the Texas obelisk. It has a, it has a certain name, but I just, uh, for the love of God, sure. I cannot come to this right now. So you can have a look at this uh, obelisk then while I'm uh, continue reading here. That he says that the Thessalian Thessalians, meaning Thessalonians, worship Neptune under this title. Okay. In Egypt, the Ammonian priests, who headed one of the chief pagan oracles of ancient Egypt, were called Peters. As Brian also says, the chief instrument or idol in their hands was styled Pietorum. So, these phallic Peter stones, we're going to continue here, these phallic Peter stones can be found all over the ancient world and all over our modern world today too, if you just have the eyes to see. Paris, London, Washington, Texas, Rome, um, Minnesota. <laughs> mm -hmm. Probably St. Right. Paul, right. right? Where you live. That's absolutely right. Yeah. These phallic Peter stones can be found all over the ancient and modern world. In fact, there is not a mention of an ancient, uh, ancient pagan oracle temple without some notice being given to a Peter emblem, the sacred stone. Like the word Peter, as it is written here, but pronounced Peter, which came to indicate simply a quote-unquote father or quote-unquote parent the word Petra came to mean any large stone. But in the earliest times it conveyed only the original religious meaning. Quote, the term Petra came at length to signify any rock or stone and to be in a manner confined to that meaning. But in the first ages it was always taken in a religious sense, never in a secular, always in a religious sense and related to the shrines of Osiris or the S-U-N Sun Baal God and to other oracles which were supposed to be exhibited as we can read in Brian's work on page 359. In other words, the term Petra meant the sacred Peter stone a stone usually phallic in design, as we have here in the picture again from Texas. And the name is, Brett? Is San Jinto. Exactly, yeah. I, San Jinto Monument, and that is the Lone Star after the Texas. Exactly, uh, yeah. Uh, they call that the Lone Star State that's uh, on the license plates, I believe, mm -hmm. for any of the cars from Texas. It says Lone Star State. Yeah. So there's your five eyes up there, up high. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why yeah. it's there. And it's in a Houston ship channel, 
Uh, it's uh, is part part of the port of Houston, one of the U.S. busiest seaports. The channel is the con- uh, conduit for ocean-going vessels between Houston area terminals and the Gulf of Mexico, and serves as an increasing as an increasing volume of inland barge traffic. Okay. Good. Now take a good look at this. This is only one of the obelisks around the world. If you want to see more, how about we just gonna do a little Google search. Obelisks in the world. And we go to pictures. And then we gonna see this. Obelisks. Peters. Everywhere. Luxor. Egypt. Cairo, Egypt, Istanbul, Turkey, Rome, Italy, Paris, France, London, Great Britain, New York, United States of America, Texas, as we yeah. just saw. You know? Now, isn't that an ancient uh, Egyptian obelisk in Central Park, New York? If I I'm don't know. Not I don't know that. I know that it is an ancient uh, Egyptian one in Rome, first of all, yes. Yes. and I know that it is an ancient one in London. Also. London, that's right. I'm not sure yep. about New York. Yeah, I don't want to uh, lean too much out of the window with knowledge that I don't have. But uh, you know, <laughs> do your own research. That's do your right. own research. <laughs> but just have a look. How many obelisks? Of course, here and there. Of course, you have some uh, same obelisks taken from another angle, another photo. But but this is not all the same. You know, just have a look. How many quote unquote Peters? This must be in London. Uh, with the big uh, wheel behind there, I think. Uh, this must be in London, right? There in London, they have this um, uh, rays of light, also cosmic axis, world axis, world pillar, center of the world, world tree, wheel of fortune, hermetic magical religious system, which was also being developed at the time. Uh, so I, I, I think this must be uh, even just scrolling through the text here. I have never wow. seen this before. Uh, this must be in London because in London they have this big uh, wheel. Uh, I don't know the name anymore. And they have... Uh, oh, or maybe it's somebody just Ferris wheel, is it? Ferris or... No. Uh, uh, or maybe just maybe someone just photoshopped this and made it this way because uh, yeah, I think this is photoshopped and he wants to express something. We'll see. Here, here should be another. Um, anyway, um, the point being, uh, just when you have a look at this uh, scrolling down, when you just easily um, use this search engine, Google, that I'm l- using right now, and go to Google Pictures, Obelisks in the World, see what kind of pictures you get all through the world. Yeah, you know, here you have here you have it, I think. This was just taken from another angle then. Uh, Oh, it seems uh, that this is Paris. Yeah, it's not English. It's uh, it's it's not Great oh. Britain. It's in Paris. Wow, interesting. It's in Paris. Look, uh, Paris here. Then you have, of course, the tower, the Eiffel Tower, which is, of course, another phallic symbol, not of stone, but a phallic symbol. And here you have another, and here you have another, and uh, just, you see, uh, also kind of phallic symbols, fleur de lis, as you have mm-hmm. here, you know, on the bridge uh, above the Seine, because this is in France, uh, this is in Paris. Uh, Wasn't the fleur de lis uh, a symbol for uh, fertility? Heraldry, heraldry, was it? Or yeah, and and, and uh, fertility, most of all. Oh, fertility. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Kind of like <laughs> the pagan ritual so. there. Look at all these pictures. So this was not a Photoshop. This was just taken from another angle, the other picture, where I saw, saw that it was Photoshop. It's not. And this is in Paris, you can see. And there you have, of course, these old, uh, this, this old one. Uh, it says, uh, the wheel of Paris and the obelisk of Luxor on the Place de la Concorde in a cold winter day. So Place de la Concorde, that is opposite to the Arc of uh, Arch of Triumph. Maybe you know that one. The Arc, uh, the, mm-hmm. the um, you know, you have this the uh, uh, Rue. Uh, oh, what's the name of that road again? I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, we, we we can we can easily go there. Um, 
Arc de Triumph. In Paris. I was there three or four times in my life. Oh, wow. Interesting. In France. So this is the Arc wow. of Triumph. So this is uh, the arch that you have on the one side. And on the opposite side of that, you have the Place de la Concorde. Yeah. So... Here you see this. This is, oh, uh, this wow. is a good picture. Oh, look at that. And here you have this, this road passing through this. And on, on the end of that road, you have the Place de la Concorde, where this uh, obelisk of Luxor was standing that we just saw. This is Paris. Yeah. And uh, you have kind of this, like in Germany and Berlin, you have the, uh, uh, the Gate of Brandenburg, uh, Brandenburger Tour. But this is the Arc de Triomphe in France, in Paris. Uh, here you see it uh, during the festivities of... Uh, oh, yeah, I've seen it before. And uh, now that you show me this picture, yeah, this looks very familiar. Another arc that is interesting to talk about is, of course, the Arc of Titus, uh, arc of Titus in Rome. Oh, yes. Yeah. So here is very a very good aerial picture. Here you have the Arc de Triomphe, and here you have the Place de la Concorde. There. Yeah. Wow. Far away. And there's this... Um, uh, Luxor obelisk in there, you know. Yeah, and then Some... they got that Las Vegas Luxor. <laughs> yeah, that's something that's else. That's a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah. And and don't you have in Las Vegas also this Black Pyramid Casino? Yes, that's it. Yeah. It's yeah. Luxor oh, that's the same. Oh, okay. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I'm not exactly what? sure, but look, look I remember at this. A video on that. Just have a look at this picture, Brad. Oh. The sun going down between the two pillars of the Arc de Triomphe. <laughs> <laughs> this is so beautiful <laughs> yeah beautiful but very meaningful for the people in the knowledge you know yeah right the and, mysteries yeah yeah for the mysteries yeah so uh, okay uh, I didn't want to spend uh, the video time all with this but I think that it is quite important um, oh it is yeah that, that we understand these connections uh, and that we see um this pillar, which is the Peter Stone, yeah, um, that we can fix that uh, into our knowledge when we read this book here. So, um, just go back to, uh, in other words, the term Petra meant the sacred Peter Stone, a stone usually in phallic in design. That's this one. Uh, when you have two, one, and then a bridge connecting them, and then you have the Arc de Triomphe, you have this arches, right? So, mm -hmm. Uh, that's the point that I wanted to make and that brings us to the end of the reading today. We will continue next time with the Petras in pagan world. We just showed you the Petras in our modern world and, um, well, that's where we're going to go probably tomorrow in our next reading of this book and I'm going to leave some closing comments of this video, of course, to Brother Brett. Thank you, Jörg. That was a wonderful reading you did today, and I really appreciate all of the uh, the hints and uh, pointers of uh, this uh, Petrus or, or Pator, or whatever um, Peter stones. Yes, Peter stones. Yeah, that's yeah, the correct and, pronunciation uh, because the vowels don't matter that much in Aramaic. That's right. The the J U Peter. Very interesting. Mm hmm. Jupiter. And uh, isn't Saturday associated with Jupiter, or am I oh. off on this one? Or Saturn, I'm sorry. That is associated to Saturn, yeah. Okay. I forget which one is, would be Jupiter, but... Yeah. But you know the name Saturday has nothing to do with our Sabbath, right? No, it doesn't, but the pagan world doesn't see it that way, you know? Yeah. Of course not. They can't see anything that's... Uh, the natural man does not know the things of God because they are spiritually discern discerned as the Bible says so that's very right. good Yerk. yeah thank you Brad yeah. for joining me today and um, I'm going to close it up right here uh, we are not going to make a five hour five minute outro that's not necessary but uh, I think you and I with the same voice mm -hmm. try to say to everybody who listens to this and watches this video to do their own research in this regard the things that Ernest L. Martin comes up with this book now you know probably or now I hope you understand why it took me 24 pages this other PDF to make an introduction because everything that we spoke in there is 
making the same points as Ernest L. Martin does here, but Ernest L. Martin goes so much deeper in that subject, goes so much deeper into the pagan origins of the name Peter, of the meaning of the Peter Stone, of the meaning that Peter was never in Rome. Really, Ernest L. Martin has done his homework. And that's what you should do too. Do your homework. Sit down on your, as we say in German, setz dich auf deine vier Buchstaben und studiere die Bibel. Yeah? Sit down on your three letters, because in English you only have three, <laughs> where we have in German four, and study your Bible. And by preparation, I would say, um, take the 1611 King James authorized version of it. Study the Bible and you will see that you can trust the Word of God. That you can trust Him when He says in Psalms 118 verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Until next time, Maranatha. <laughs>